So this is, um, I think we, we, with the background entertainment from the from the drilling, mu musical un undercover. Um, so this is a, it's like a little experience report um, based on some work that I did at, um, at Pivotal. I'm actually a, my steady job is with Zorker Engineering in, in London, but I also trade independently and, and a higher order logic. And, and this was a, a short contract that I, I did at Pivotal. Um, and it's about an experimental spike that we did on, on a quite a complex Go project about making the integration tests a bit faster and, and, and cleaner. Um, and we learned a number of things, and one of which is that, that teams have to move at their own speed. Um, there's a lot of code in the talk, so if it gets a bit much, just sit back and relax. Um, <laughs> just, just go for the general structure. Don't, don't worry about the detail. Um, who, just out of curiosity, has, has anybody here actually used Go? So there's a few, few hands up. That's all right. Um, again, don't worry about it. It's, a, it's a, in many respects, it's a standard curly brace language. Um, if you used any modern language, it, it'll be pretty familiar, which is one of its goals. Um, the whole team on the project was involved in this work, but most of it was um, Winner Bridgewater and me. And Winner, Brid Winner is uh, busy looking after a new baby, so she's, she's got more important things to do. Um, but just to make a point, this, this talk is only incidentally about Go and testing and sort of test frameworks and stuff. It's the, the lessons are really about an approach to writing code um, and a little bit about team dynamics. Uh, and if you, if by the way, if you can't hear at the back, or if, if it's just, just raise a hand, because I can't tell, especially with these glasses on. So it's it's a fairly complicated structure. So just let me walk you, just relax, keep breathe deeply, and I'll walk you through the the cast of characters. So this is based on a platform called Cloud Foundry, which is a cloud platform um, uh, supported by Pivotal. Um, part of it is a tool uh, that associated with it is a, uh, or with from a piddle, is a tool called Bosch, which is a, as you can see, it's a tool for release engineering. So you write declarative descriptions of the system you want, uh, mostly in YAML, and then press the button and stuff appears on your cloud. Um, it's got a very steep learning curve, um, but it's very powerful. It was apparently developed by people who had originally done the work, done similar work at Google. And this was their sort of uh, some of their experience. As like a lot of distributed systems um, within Cloud Foundry, there's a thing called a service broker, uh, which is a service that has a catalog of service offerings, and then will request to respond to requests for provisioning and bringing them up and down, and the, us the usual sort of the usual sort of thing. This particular project was called a, was a thing called an on-demand service broker, and the idea was that uh, is that um, if a particular service is getting a lot of requests, that it'll automatically spin up some new instances and then take them down when they're not when they're not needed. Um, to make this work, the service adapter has to know how to create a uh, the service broker has to know how to create a, a service, and there's a thing called a service adapter. Uh, which will, uh, on request, will create some uh, Bosch control structures for that particular service. Um, and it's an executable because the idea, it, it's, it's a binary or script or whatever, because the idea is that um, you should be able to do this for any service, whatever, whatever language it's written in. And then finally, the last bit is that they're using a, um, a test matcher framework uh, called Ginkgo and Gomega. Um, which is a it, it's uh, modelled on um, RSpec in that whole sort of BDD world. If you're familiar with that, um, so that's all all the parts, and the, the sort of they'll come up again. And it is a messy problem. So here we are. If you can see that that little chunk in the middle is the on-demand broker, and you see it's it's attached to a service service adapter. Um, and so when the request comes in, it you know. But goes through all this stuff, um, goes to the on-man broker, service adapter, um, 
generates the Bosch and creates the calls the create instance and then creates some in, spins up some instances as appropriate. But you can see it's at the core it's actually in quite deep. How do you test one of these? Um, if you remember that bit about how the service adapter is actually a binary, the way they were um, testing against that was to have a stub service adapter, which is this thing down here, which is a binary that you can spin out. How do you set that up is you use um, uh, environment variables and you propagate them down. You export them and they propagate down and the stub service, the stub adapter will pick them up and return them and respond appropriately. The rest of it, the other adapt, the, the other collaborators are usual sort of mocks and stubs in the thing. And then you finally do your interaction with your on-demand on broker and get your result as appropriate. Okay, so again, it's, it's a bit bit complicated, even 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 at the best of times. So, one of the problems that when I came in was that the tests were slow and brittle, like 20, 25 minutes for some of the some of the services. So here's an example, and if you're familiar with this style, this the sort of aspect style, there's this sort of notion of a context and some assertions that go inside it. Um, so if we start from the top, there's a uh, before suite that compiles and builds all the binaries, and I'll explain why that, that happens in a minute. Um, first context, we're in the context of updating a service instance, and then there's some before each, set up some collaborators, and just before each, start the broker, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then within that context, the, the next context is we're switching plans. Um, and again, we set up the manifest for the, the adapter return. This has to be done first because we're passing it down through um, environment variables, and then there's the actual check that, that uh, the, the context that there are no pending changes, and again a bit more just before each and the rest of it, and then there's a series of assertions about what happens, like the, the, the return code and that the right values come back and, and so on and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a number of issues to this. One is there's a lot of this. This particular file was about 970 lines. And this is one of a dozen, so you know that's a lot of text for not that many, um, not that many uh, checks. I always found the flow of control with this before and just before stuff very confusing. It sort of passes up and down the context a couple of times, and to this day I can't quite remember what happens when. And it was complicated or compounded by the fact that they were keeping um, some of the values you needed to know about were being kept in, ver in, in uh, mutable fields. So they would be set at various points in this thing as you bounced up and down the stack, and I just I, I couldn't cope with that. Uh, more entertainingly, each of, these, whoops, each of these assertions here would trigger an entire run of the whole context stack to get there. So it, each of these essentially spins up uh, a new environment, and that's not fast. And then finally, the thing that, that, that also did bother me about this was that um, you, at this level, we're describing all the bits and pieces, but we're not really describing the context. We, well, we want a better word. We're not describing the, co the, the concept that we're trying to ex exercise here. We're describing the bits and pieces of the concept, and then you have to figure out for yourself, what that means. So that's the first stage, the, the, the top level view. Within that, if we take one of these, this second one, which is the um, includes the operation data in the response, if we actually look inside that, we'll see that, um, again, I'm trying to do this with the wrong pair of glasses. Um, one of the interesting features about Go is it doesn't support exceptions. Their view is that what you do if you have a return value that might fail is you return a tuple with the value and an error object, and then you check the error object. We have the advantage here that if you get an error object, we should just fail, so we can use our Ginkgo assertions to just assert uh, that, that there's no error. Um, but it means that there's a lot of noise here, which is about essentially about getting hold of the JSON from the response and then unpacking it into a structure. Um, and similarly, that down here, you see these by clauses. They're actually written out whatever happens to the, to the output. And it's a way of, of keeping track. But it also means that you get noisy success cases. Um, 
And you'll notice that there's actually only four lines here of sort of interesting behavior or interesting assertion. And the rest of it is all just infrastructure and getting there. So again, when you look at one of these, there's an awful lot of reading to do to get to the, the heart of the matter. Um, so how do you get here? And, you know, as, as I said, you know, stuff happens. It's not evil people or anything. One is that it's a, it is a complicated environment to understand and test. There's, as you can see, there's a lot of moving parts. There's lots and lots of global state. Um, it started as an exploratory, as a spike, essentially, as an exploratory project just to see if it was possible. And then it turned into a production project. And again, as always, there's always sort of time commercial pressure. So they never quite had enough time to, to rework. One of the reasons for some of the flakiness at the time was that there was shared infrastructure that wasn't quite enough. Now, this has since been fixed, um, but it did tend to slow things down. And then finally, um, so they're using um, uh, Pivotal have a, uh, a, a build system called Concourse, which has lots of no really nice features, and especially sort of pipelines and things. Uh, one of its curiosities is that it doesn't actually, s it doesn't out of the box store artifacts to be passed down the chain. Um, you have to do that by, by hand or in, in your setup by yourself. So quite often the easiest thing to do with a binary is just to rebuild it. Um, and the one thing about Go is it's designed to, to compile very quickly. So it's not a big deal, but it's a bit um, thing. But it also means that if you want to see what's going on, um, you want to sort of put information about what happened somewhere, um, it's very, the, the big temptation is to stick those by clauses in and just write stuff out to the output and then you can see it. So there are some things you can do immediately without changing the world. One thing to do is you take all this stuff and you just hang on to the value and stick it into one test case. So you can see that the, um, this now has a name which includes the operation data in the response and then you can put all that stuff ins inside that and that, that gives you, as you can see, it gives you a 10 times speed up, or well, not quite 10 times speed up, but a significant speed up um, out of the box and uh, a more meaningful context name. The other thing is if you look in, whoops, did I just press the wrong button? Press the wrong button. Let's try this again. The other thing you can do is some of that long code is you can extract out some of the common behavior. So if you remember all that stuff about getting the response body and unpacking the JSON and converting the JSON into objects and the rest of it, that happens over and over again. And I don't really care about it in the body of the test. So I can push that into a helper method or helper function. Um, I can hang on to the variables. You can see here, that's the thing we're hanging on to. And similarly, some of that stuff, I can uh, that sucking out the detail that I care about from the, uh, the JSON that we get, or the object structure that we get back, again, I can do that and push that into a, into a supporting structure. Um, and it turned out that this particular, this particular function, when we did the refactoring, was used repeated six times throughout the code. So that there's a, a collapse there without, without even trying very hard. So we learned that, amongst other things, is to refactor the test code. Test code is, t is still code, and it's worth refactoring. And you're looking for things like commonality, and you're looking for to explain what the hell is going on, rather than just sequences of uh, sequences of, of code. So we pushed at this for a while, um, and it was better than it was before. But for me, I kind of hit the wall. Um, there are a number of things. One is that before each, just before each flow, I found very, like I said, I found that very difficult to understand. Um, and very, very difficult to refactor because I couldn't quite tell what, where, where things were happening. Um, maybe it needs someone cleverer than me. Um, but the other thing was at a more conceptual level, I found it hard to understand which way to go because the, the code had such strong opinions. Um, and I found it hard to rethink clearly. So I wanted to try and build, rebuild these tests up from, from first principles, if you like. Um, and in practice, it was easy to do because we could start a new parallel structure with new integration tests and leave the old ones in place so that we didn't block the team while they were or make things break while they're busy trying to get work done. It's work done. Um, and there were a couple of things that, that, one of the things about the flow that was important is this, again, if you remember the th whole thing about setting up the environment variables, 
that means that certain parts of the sequence are important and have to be preserved, which again was one of those blocks to certain kinds of refactoring. So it was just a bit tricky. Um, the other part of this was I had some secret implicit goals. Um, I wanted to see what an expressive code that described the domain would look like, because I think I think I thought that there was something valuable in there. I wanted to think about writing tests in terms of composability, and I wanted to get there by refactoring. So let's step back a minute. Let's just begin at the beginning. Um, this is pseudocode for our first test, and it's sort of fairly s straightforward. There's a before where you start the broker and an after where you stop it. You do some setup. Uh, you trigger the event by requesting a binding, and then you check what comes back and and the logs. So that's that's the heart of the again the heart of the thing. And what you what we did is we took this literally and we filled it in with working code. And I'm doing things like compiling and setting up the collaborators. As we went along with the refactoring, we started extracting types to represent the various players in the test, um, like the Bosch and the Cloud Foundry and the Service Adapter and the Broker. And the thing to be clear is that this is not, we're not extracting domain-domain uh, objects. We're just extracting the from the test point of view. This is the test view of the broker, not the actual broker. Uh, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. Um, and in practice, we, we used a lot of the original support code because it wasn't worth rewriting all, the, all the, the fake objects and all that kind of infrastructure. Maybe if it had gone on, it would have been worth doing that. And there were things we thought about, but we didn't, didn't get around to. So the whole point of this is to keep the detail out of the test. And in, this is how the test, test looked at the end, at the first test looked at the end. So let me just walk this through. Is we start off by creating this thing called a, um, a new broker environment, uh, which is a broker and its collaborators. Defer is the um, Go equivalent to try finally. So it says, at the end of this, don't forget to, don't, don't forget to clean up. Um, there's some setup. These are sort of stub preparations. Uh, we say something about the, the, the binding, then we start it, and then we do some more stubby things. Here's the actual trigger event. We get a response to a uh, creation event, and then we make some expect we, we we check some some return values. Finally, we check the log, and then we just verify that everything ha has happened that is is supposed to. Um, and you see all that noise has just been pushed out in this into this thing that which is, you know, one screen even at this even at this resolution, and is reasonably I think reasonably easy to follow. And you get things like this, this respond to a response as a response to a, a creation request. Um, and the way you progress is you write, we wrote a number of tests around this and then sort of looked for the similarities and teased them out. Um, and in fact, what's not on here is there was some premature, premature abstraction that sort of got carried away for a while uh, that we turned into a dead end and we had, we had to back out. Um, so let's take a look at, at some of these pieces. So here's the broker environment. And you can see it's a broker and a bunch of collaborators. What can you do with a broker? What we can do with the environment, you can start it and verify it and close it. Um, and what we're trying to do is delegate behavior out of the body of the test into, into all these supporting objects and hide the detail in, in the domain types. And he, here's an example. Here's the broker. And you'll see that the broker is actually um, you can tell from this it's actually an executable. We, we, run, we start a session and we run it. And one of the nice things about this, which is not obvious immediately, is that um, Ginkgo has support for running tests in parallel. And at some point, we had enough tests that we wanted to make them go in parallel. Um, so we stuck this, this Ginkgo parallel node and sort of stuck that in the broker so we could have an its, its own port. The nice thing about that is we did that entirely without changing the body of the, the, the code in the test. That meant that we could, because we've hidden all this information and stuck it somewhere where we don't need to worry about it, um, it's standard information hiding. Keep the noise, keep the detail out of the body of the test and push it into the, into the supporting objects. And we use the early tests to sort of explore the space. So you have your basic success case, a more complex success case, and then you start making sure you've got a couple of failures um, just to make sure that you can actually test the failures and see, see the results. 
so that went for a while. Am I? Uh, how's my speed? Am I going too fast or too slow? Or is it okay? Good. Sorry. Um, so we we carried on with this, and we 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 sort of taking a couple of runs. And there's a certain amount of duplication going on, which is okay because you're you're trying to explore the space. And then we decided to sort of push hard on the refactoring and see where it took us. And I'll show you in a second where we we ended up. And you'll see that it's quite a jump from where we started. And this actually, when we get through with this, is it it ref it's a nice follow-on from Venkat's talk this morning. It's, 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 it's sort of uh, an example of some of the things he was talking about. So here's how the test looked when we when we were done. So here's our case. It says when we're creating a new binding. So there's the the triggering event, um, and there's this context with the, of. I'll, I'll walk through these pieces, but CredHub is a sort of um, uh, credential thing, um, and we're we're saying that um, the service adapter will return a binding, and we're saying that the the Bosch has some VMs available. What we expect to happen when this is all over is that the broker will respond with these state with these these values, and that will have logged um, this this message. Um, I don't know how many people remember pre and post conditions from college. You know, a little bit designed by contract. So if you like the, um, the with clause is the preconditions. This is the situation that we're in now, and that that. The broker chunk is the post conditions. That's the things that should have happened afterwards. That's what you would expect. Most of this is, it's all syntax sugar. It's the same code sort of reassembled in, in, in a different structure. So I want to walk through this, um, sort of s just so it's, see how it breaks down. Um, and the thing is, it's, you can do th this, this happens to be written in Go, but you can do it in most any language. Um, so let's take this first clause when creating a new binding. This is actually, whoa, don't overshoot, when creating a new binding. This is actually, um, this bit is entirely sugar. The when clause, um, so requestifier is, is a thing, a function, that takes a broker environment and gives you a request back somehow. Um, the when clause is just sugar. It's just to give you somewhere to, to get started um, and to make it read slightly better. And in this case, we create a new binding, which, as you can see, pushes the behavior down onto our, our test broker object, which actually does the real work. What we're doing is, is this, again, you see this translation layer. Um, but you'll notice that the name is designed to fit into a sentence. Um, so what we've got now is a requestifier, and we're going to call the with method on it. Here's the with method. Uh, what does with do? Um, with takes various things and gives you back a test setup. Uh, and a test setup is, again, is the, um, the requestifier and then various uh, collaborators that it needs to go, to go with it. One of the nice things about Go is that you can is extend um, a type, or you can extend a, a, you know, a type and add methods to it in a different file. So you'll see what we're doing in this file is we're extending the requestifier object. Okay. Um, and again, we see we're also using a lot of functions here. There's a lot of behavior that's actually in functions, and that gives us control over the time as to when stuff actually happens. And you'll see why this, this comes up later. Um, and these are our preconditions for the test. No, no cred hub is, a, is just a null object. Um, the service adapter returns a binding, and um, and again, it's all it's all set up of set up of uh, mocks and stubs and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, but the nice thing about doing this as, as functions and, and giving them names is, is they have names um, that describe what they do, rather than just a chunk of code in the middle of a, something larger. Um, and you'll see one you'll see why this comes up later. So now we have a test set up, and we call this method the broker on it. Um, And here it is. The, this is, if you remember back to this thing, which was the test that we had before, you see it's actually the same structure with a few things teased out into supporting functions. 
But the thing about this at this point is that this is the only place this is defined. We've boiled it down to one exactly one occurrence of this. Um, and it's pretty obvious if you read it through. And we've got, we pass in a couple of checkers that are functions that make assertions about stuff that should have happened. Um, there's the same behavior here where we call the service adapter first because we have to set up the environment variables before you pass through. Um, it's, to me, this is, this is, is pretty readable. Um, so again, it, it's just a straight match. And if you look at the checkers, again, it's this thing about um, what they're doing is delegating down to, this is just asserting stuff on, on stuff, that, stuff that happens. Um, the thing that's slightly confusing for this, about this, for, if, depending on your experience, is a function that returns a function. So it's, it's effectively a closure. And the reason we're doing that is because it's, it's um, in, in direction in time. So here we're checking the status code and the, and the JSON body. And the log checker um, does something very similar for um, checking the logs. And again, it's this thing about this, this levels of language. This, it's like a shim between the test and the supporting objects and some other bits and pieces. Um, standard implement, and, and you see here we, we, we delegate down to the broker, to the broker object to actually do the work. And finally, uh, we compose all these pieces together uh, to make a test. And you can see that, that, you know, that, that this is a, a abstraction, total abstraction of the things that matter. And now what we've got is here's another one. And you notice it's actually very similar because we, we're reusing most of, the part, most of the pieces. In this case, this is a failure test, so we're saying that there's no service adapter and there's no VMs available. Um, and we've got little things there that, that make that make that um, make that explicit, and then you you, you know, slightly different uh, return, slightly different checking uh, checking statuses. But again, you, you because you boil it down to the thing, you're now just dealing with here's one situation, here's another situation, and you're just dealing with the differences. All the other stuff that's common has been extracted out, and you only use that once. And here's another one that's slightly similar. Um, in this case, we do have a credentials hub, so we we pop one up, and this is local to the test, so it's not put out into the, in some global variable somewhere. It's just used here, so we, we we create it here in this context, and we can create a little um, uh, another another uh, setup function. Again, it's a closure, so you can pass it around and, and and use it, and just plug that in to the existing framework. Again, you can see that that. They're all very similar. So you can imagine uh, running through four or five of these, and you can see immediately what's going on, rather than 976 lines of interpretation. Oh, it's not me. OK. OK, I'll get on with it. Um, blah, 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 blah. So what do we get? Domain language approach, you get um, 15 minutes. Compact tests in domain terminology, and the, compa and the, the thing about the being compact is really important. Um, going back to the keynote, less, declarative, uh, less imperative, more declarative. In static languages, I like to use static types to define relationships. Um, you know, your mileage may vary. But they are, you've seen that they are extensible and composable. Again, here's a bit of extensibility. We've, we've declared some, a new function, and we just pop it in because we're dealing with uh, pieces that we can plug together. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Core implementation uh, behavior implemented once rather than repeated. And we're not overworking the, the test framework. So one of the interesting things that, that sort of came up about this is Ginkgo, which is the test framework, is about the domain of testing. It shouldn't be about the domain of testing your system. And if you think about it, there are these multiple domains, even in something as simple as a, as a test. There's a uh, system test, uh, there's the domain of testing, there's the domain of the features of your system as described to someone who wants to know what's going on. Though there are test roles, so how do you, what are the components of this, who are the players in this, in this test? There are the system drivers, which is how do you implement those players? And then there's the actual system. And what you're looking for 
with a lot of this stuff is is keeping each in each piece is keeping the the language consistent within within the, within that within that domain and so um, one of the things to look at when you're writing code is to tease apart the vocabulary. Um, if you want to do this, you need a couple of things. You need time to refactor out the common behavior. If you're just under the gun, well, that's, that's, that's a, another issue. It takes a commitment to get the name right because one of the things about this approach is there are a lot more names involved. Instead of having just a long watch of code, you've got lots of functions that need names, so you have to think quite carefully about some of that. And then it needs a certain familiarity with things like function passing and composing types to get, uh, composing objects together. We've gone off on a bit of a bender for this uh, for, for a week or so, uh, a couple of weeks, and then we presented it back to the team. And they, although they'd seen it as we were going along, and it was a bit of a shock. Because um, you can imagine if they're used to the 976 line thing and then they go straight to this, and it's like, what happened to my test? Um, so, there were things they liked. They liked the way the style reduced the noise. They particularly liked removing, moving from global state to local because there's a chance of tracking what's going on. And that quieting down some of the ginkgo noise, particularly in the outputs, because you don't, really don't want noisy success cases because then you can't see the bits that matter. And GoMega is actually quite a good match library and we started to use that a bit more. Uh, Use a bit, use that a bit more, and that 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 helped. Um, but the interaction was hard to understand, and this is a problem with with being declarative. Is sometimes you lose track of where stuff is happening, and it, it you kind of have to get used to it, and you have to decide whether it's worth the trade-off. Um, the approach was very different from what they were used to. Um, in fact, the whole floor are full of people, or the whole company. So, um, and that was an issue because they did they had regular rotation between uh, of people between teams, and they were concerned that the learning curve would be too steep if someone got dropped onto a team, and then all of a sudden they get dropped into this rather than what they were used to. So they we reached a sort of they, you know they, they resolved what was important for them that they particularly liked immutable test setup which is actually a thing I forgot to mention, is again, the thing about that structure is it's almost all immutable, which is so much easier to reason, reason about. Um, avoid the just before each before uh, stuff. Don't do the granular test. That makes that style is fine at the unit level, but at the integration level, it's, it's just too slow. Um, don't reinvent GoMega, so the match has, has got lots of, lots of stuff in there for, for helping you out. Um, and again, don't Overexploit Ginkgo for um, for stuff that, that actually shouldn't shouldn't really be in, used in that, and then finally um, putting an emphasis on tests that explain their purpose rather than how they happen to be implemented. So I think there are um, a few lessons to learn. One is um, keep your tests under control, even if it's an experiment, and even if you're in a, even in a prototype, even if you're in a hurry, because I, if your test sort of get out of control and start running a bit slowly. Um, there's two possibilities. Either those tests are useful, but now you're going slower because they're, they're running slowly, or actually they're not useful, in which case you should just delete them. But either way, you should fix them. Um, extract structure in your test code. Again, what we see a lot of is, is that you, know, you do super refactoring in the production code, and then the test code just kind of happens. And to keep to, if you're going to live with it, it's, it's as, if anything, it's harder to write than your production code. Um, you can do it in your language. This is not about Go. I mean, Go is the vehicle, but I've done this in everything, including Bash scripts, which is incredibly painful, but did actually have some interesting side effects. It did actually make the code, the scripts look a little better. Um, it's worth doing the experiment if you have a strong idea. Um, one of the lines I used to like is, if you've never gone too far, how do you know where the boundaries are? Um, it's worth, occasionally, if you have this idea, just overdo it. Just see where it takes you. Um, because then you might discover that actually you could go further in whichever particular direction it is. Um, and then the other side of that is sometimes you have to roll back a bit for consensus. Um, and it's easy to sort of drift off into the into some magic declarative space and then sort of leave everyone behind. 
Um, and that's the, that's the summary. And I'm realizing I was confused with the timing because the slide deck bounced. Um, any comments or questions? Sorry, I can go there. Uh, you mentioned about uh, granularity of your uh, tests and uh, the question is uh, so we have like two extremes one that is we we would like to test only single point uh, of your application or we would like to test some script yeah so as far as I understand at the moment you are, are moving uh, closer to the script uh, testing so you are trying to test some scenario within your code so not to repeat all the preparation work yeah so that is the approach you have at the moment Yep. Because uh, I saw within the test there are quite uh, repetitive uh, statements uh, regarding the infrastructure uh, spin up. So maybe you can. Yeah, drop the several the granular, what I meant with granularity was this stuff, where each of these had a, was treated as a separate assertion rather than being collapsed into a single thing. And, and, and it's a style you see sometimes with uh, some of the sort of the RSpec inspired. Um, frameworks as against doing that which is where you kind of collapse and then you do the assertions inside so does that does that make sense uh, yeah uh, that's clear the question is uh, yeah. when, uh, please come back to the first slide uh, yeah uh, when um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, in general, uh, you started with a quite complex infrastructure, so there's some VMs we spin up, uh, etc. Yeah. Uh, so, what is the duration for this single test with uh, this number of uh, uh, as assertion points? And if we will rewrite this the same test uh, yeah. and we will try to assert oh, yeah, only yeah. a single one within the test, so what w will be the difference within the time? I can't, rem I can't remember because we didn't, m I can't remember what the measurements were, but this one basically you hang on to the single result and then it's yeah and i mean it's obviously some some kind of speed up because you're not restarting the whole system every time the number i can't remember sorry it, w it was enough that we noticed um okay thanks and there's one at the front it, it was it was significant and it's very easy to do as well Better. <laughs> Sorry, I really can't remember. I, I wouldn't want to go on the record. Sorry. You, you mentioned that the team uh, thought it was over abstracted and it was difficult for them, and then you rolled a little bit back. So, can you describe how further you rolled it back? Um, uh, how so much back, not further, I guess. <laughs> I think that. So I mean, the thing is, I rolled off the team shortly after this. So you know, I, I, I was, and in fact, what happened shortly after was was they didn't write any code for a long time because they were doing other things. So and then the team rolled over. So, <laughs> um, but I thought that the the lesson from this is that there's a lot you can do without turning the world upside down. Even you know, it's, if if this is the you know where they started and this is where the experiment ended up, you know, they could there's the stuff they could do here which was um, uh, with a lot of this stuff. And, and so again, I, c I can't give you a clean answer to that. But I think it was if you treat it as a learning, a learning thing, then. Uh, yeah. And another question would yeah. be, uh, did they continue and added more tests to it? Or did it, uh, because it's a very abstracted way of displaying the environment and the setup. Yeah. D did they manage to continue and move in? No, no, I mean, this, 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 this branch died. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you know, lessons were learned. So, um, I think actually, we oh, all right, just one more, then we, we have, have to break. Time? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Um, so another more specific question about the parts that the team did not like. Yeah. You mentioned the indirection of the setup. Yes. Could you elaborate about that a bit? Yeah, because an awful lot of this is you know a function that returns a function and then gets called later and all this kind of stuff. So if you're sitting there trying to reason about what's happening. And you look at it, you look at one of these functions you're passing around, and you want to know when it's called. Is you have to go over there, and then sort of work through the the flow, which is harder if you're not used to it compared to sort of linear, a more linear approach. 
So it was that sort of thing. And I know I sort of worked, I mean, worked on stuff where you keep chasing it through and you, you're not quite sure when something's going to get called. So the, there's, a, there's a learning curve where you have to absorb the model before you can kind of understand how the pieces fit together. So okay? Good. I, I think we have to, uh, I think we've run out of time. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>